As many hospital and health system leaders look for solutions to address the root causes of violence in their organizations and communities, some AHA members have already figured out how to make their organizations a safer and more peaceful environment in which to receive care. As we observe AHA's 8th annual Have Hope Day today, we look to Pennsylvania-based WellSpan Health to share how the implementation of their Behavioral Health Emergency Response Team has successfully de-escalated incidents of workplace violence by 75% since 2019. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast from the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederley with AHA Communications. In this podcast hosted by Jordan Steiger, Senior Program Manager of Clinical Affairs and Workforce with AHA, she is joined by Dr. Kenneth Rogers, who shares how WellSpan Health is leading the way in implementing training and increasing capacity for their team members to respond to situations that could result in violence. Dr. Rogers is Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Behavioral Health at WellSpan Health. So, Dr. Rogers, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited um, to learn more about your work, given that workplace violence is, you know, a problem that a lot of our hospitals and health systems across the country are dealing with. Yeah, you know, it, it is a huge issue everywhere. Um, violence against healthcare, healthcare professionals has gone up substantially over, over time, and so it is such a huge issue, especially post-COVID with everybody being frustrated, upset about things, and just on edge. Absolutely. I know that that will resonate with a lot of our listeners. So before we get started um, learning about your work, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about WellSpan Health and just your role within your healthcare system. Sure. WellSpan Health is a health system, about 20,000 employees. We're located in South Central Pennsylvania. We cover five counties um, in that area. Comprehensive integrated delivery system in those five hospitals, behavioral health. We have um, inpatient services, we have emergency room services, we have Phil Haven Hospital, which is a freestanding psychiatric hospital with 137 beds, about total about 200 beds across the entire system for behavioral health. That's great. And what is your role in, within the system? So my role is the uh, chief medical officer for behavioral health. For behavioral health. And you are a physician, correct? I'm an adult child and adolescent psychiatrist. Wonderful. Okay. So I know we're here today to talk about the success that WellSpan has had in de-escalating issues of workplace violence. But before we do that, I would really like to learn just about, you know, your own personal perspective as both a psychiatrist and an administrator um, on what led you to being so passionate about this work. So I spent the first part of my career in corrections, um, a lot of work in juvenile justice. And so one of the things that you learn in juvenile justice is really de-escalation, trying to keep environments safe, and really just trying to really think about the environment almost constantly. And so as I progressed throughout my career and working on inpatient child units and, and other kinds of settings, you sit there and you look at situations where you're saying that could have been handled so much better and a situation escalated that really didn't have to escalate. And one of my positions I had before this was at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. And at Parkland, there was a huge initiative around workplace violence, largely because it's a city-based hospital. There's a mixed population. There's really not a majority population. And so there, were a lot, there was a lot of work that was being done in the largest emergency room in the United States around how do we think about cultural issues and in those cultural issues, how do we think about workplace violence issues that really arise out of things that people aren't really thinking about because the perspectives are just so different between the two individuals that often are involved in the situation. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I think that context, you know, in the, the care environment is so important. And I think a lot of this can often arise from just misunderstandings and miscommunications between people. Absolutely. The vast majority of them are simply misunderstandings or lack of communication. 
right? Which seems like it should be a simple thing to fix, but we know that that's not always the case, right? When people are stressed, communication is usually the first thing to go. Exactly, exactly. So since you've been at WellSpan, I think this has been since the beginning of 2019, if I'm remembering correctly, um, you've implemented what you're calling the Behavioral Health Emergency Response Team, but we'll call it BERT for today because that's a little easier to say. Um, And you've been able to successfully de-escalate workplace violence incidents by 75%. Is that right? That's correct. Tell me about that. Tell me how this got started and how you've had such success. So the BERT team has actually been around for for a while. And initially, it was a very nursing-driven model that really focused on inpatient care and trying to figure out how do we help nurses on inpatient units do a better job. My background is largely from emergency departments. I've spent most of my career working in and out of various emergency departments as a consulting psychiatrist. And so when I arrived, the thing that became increasingly clear was there were issues on the floor, but a lot of our workplace violence issues were actually happening in our emergency departments. It was happening in places outside of kind of your traditional patient in bed kind of situation, whether it was with families, whether it was with staff members getting into disagreements with each other. Those are some of the areas where I felt that it was really a problem. And so as we kind of looked at and talked through some of this and we looked at the training we gave a lot of our mental health professionals, we felt like this is something that we could really roll out to the system in general so that folks had a greater capacity to be able to actually engage and de-escalate situations. That sounds great. So it sounds like this is a a nursing-led initiative, or has that changed at all uh, as it's evolved over time? Still tends to be largely nursing-driven for most of the inpatient work. However, in the emergency departments and some of the other areas, there are lots of other people that tend to be more involved, especially mental health professionals, some of our behavioral health counselors, which are master's level clinicians um, that are engaged in a a lot of that work. And so trying to really be more specific based on the areas where people are people are located. That's great. It's always important, I think, to bring up the workforce, you know, because a lot of uh, hospitals and health systems are struggling with workforce issues right now. So trying to think about who is involved, who it takes to make this successful. Absolutely. So you mentioned, you know, the, the on the floor professionals, those master's level clinicians, those nurses, the people that are really doing this de-escalation. Um, but let's talk about leadership and leadership buy-in. Obviously, you as the um, CMO for behavioral health know that de-escalation works. You know this is a practice that is evidence-based that shows a lot of success. But how did you get other leaders in your organization on board with this? You know, it really wasn't me trying to get other leaders in the organization engaged. It was the leaders of the organization saying that, Ken, you need to be engaged. Because it becomes increasingly clear if you're the CEO of a health system that you've got employees getting hurt. You've got a clear vision that there are folks that their morale is dropping. They are frustrated about coming to work. They don't find the joy at work anymore. And nobody wants to go to work to be attacked by a patient or a family member. And so that, I think, was the vision that our senior leadership of the organization was seeing. And it was really their vision to say, you know, we need to do what we need to do to figure out how to make our employees feel safe, how to help them enjoy work, and help to send a message that this is a safe place to to be. And so that was where we kind of started this entire process from. And I think the other driver was looking at our emergency departments, which were increasingly busy. We had a lot more borders at that particular point in time. And as people are staying in emergency departments for, you know, days on end, looking at four walls, and you already have some degree of agitation um, in the background, it leads to issues that you just, you know, shouldn't have in hospitals. And so there was kind of this buy-in from kind of everybody in the organization from almost day one. that This is definitely something that we should address um, and do something about. That's great that everybody's on the same page. And I mean, you bring up a lot of really important issues, you know, the joy in work, decreasing burnout and, you know, increasing worker well-being. Those are all things that I think we all care about right now, especially as, you know, we know that that has 
kind of ebbed and flowed a little bit over the course of, you know, caring, caring for people through COVID and, you know, kind of this period that we're in right now. So I think that that's um, thinking about this, not only from how this benefits your patient population, but also your workforce, I think is really, really important. Absolutely. So walk us through maybe a patient situation, de-identified, obviously, but something that sticks out to you that um, where this BERT program really was successful. Sure, I can think I can think of many examples, but but I'll I'll give you one that I really think encompasses kind of lots of issues. And this one actually happened on an obstetric service. Had a patient that, that was there with her family from a Latino background. And if you look at the situation, she spoke relatively good English. It seemed like she was understanding things, but there was this sense that she was getting increasingly frustrated. And so Bert ended up getting called because she, the husband, the nursing staff, things just seemed to really blow up. She was getting angry, loud, volatile, what's happening here. And so there was a sense that there were risks to the nurses. She's about to deliver. So there's risks to the baby. Husband's there. So, you know, what's really going on? So you arrive in a situation and what was, I think, apparently clear from day one, from moment one, is that you had a person whose English skills weren't great. And so there were pieces of things that she could communicate outward, but didn't necessarily fully understand, especially in a healthcare context. And so some of the healthcare discussions that were occurring weren't really clear. Her husband was less fluent than she was, And so she was trying to translate things that she was understanding to him and he really wasn't understanding. And so you had this family that was sitting there frustrating because of lack of communication. And so the intervention had nothing to do with medications or anything. It had to do with let's get a translator or someone who is Spanish speaking um, to help really work the family through what's happening next so they could become much more engaged and involved in their care and feel more empowered. And so that was actually the intervention that Bert did for that particular day. It seems relatively simple, but it's things like that in a healthcare context that happen all the time. People are busy, nurses are busy trying to get things done, doctors are getting in and out and doing rounds. And so people don't pick up on the fact that the patient may not be fully understanding what's going on. So are there things that we can do differently? I really love that you use that example because I think oftentimes when we think about, you know, de-escalating situations, we think of a situation of violence. And this is not something that required any kind of intervention in that perspective. It was just really taking that moment, like you said, to understand the patient's needs and course correct. Right. So I think that's a great example. Right. And so in that particular situation, I think there were really a number of super positive things that happened. One the nurse that actually did the birth call recognized that things were escalating before they really got to kind of that violence place. So that was the number one thing. I think the other thing was the level of support that she felt to be able to do that because having done a lot of work to make people feel comfortable that, you know, if you need help, just, just call. And so there wasn't a hesitance to do so. But then there were also people that could respond relatively quickly and having the resources and understanding of those resources to be able to provide them in real time to the staff and patients. Because that was a situation that could have spiraled out of control very quickly. Because you could see that the family was getting increasingly upset. The staff was a little nervous and scared. And you put those two things together and it doesn't lead to a great outcome. But able to get her calm pretty quickly. Family was actually happy with the situation and the rest of the delivery went smoothly. Sounds like best case scenario. And again, a great example of why a program like this in your hospital can really be beneficial. One thing I'm realizing I didn't ask you that I think our listeners would be curious about is how are people trained to be on the BERT team? Our behavioral health professionals um, working on any behavioral health unit, inpatient or outpatient, go through a three-day mandatory training. And in that three-day training, the first portion of it is really looking at the phases of escalation and de-escalation and being able to recognize when somebody's at really low level 
and when they are kind of going up to some of the higher levels and looking at de-escalation techniques to be able to get them to that place. Day two and three are looking at more mental health based interventions and trying to think about more hands on figuring out how do you get people really calm when they're beyond um, the place that they can be de-escalated. So what we've done with BERT is really trying to make sure every employee in the health system gets at least part of day one. So every employee is able to recognize the levels of escalation, levels of de-escalation, and some basic skills to be able to do that. Then for people that are going to do more mental health or BERT related work is really thinking about day two of a lot of that work where you're getting some more in-depth skills to be able to manage some of those more difficult situations. That makes sense. I love that you focus on giving training to all of your workforce and then, you know, really kind of um, focusing in on those behavioral health providers. That's great. So I think, Dr. Rogers, your example of your program is truly one of the best that I've heard of across the country. I mean, being able to de-escalate, you know, violent situations by 75 percent is pretty incredible. So if another um, hospital or health system is maybe inspired by this conversation to think about this in their own, you know, care setting, what advice would you give them? So I do think that it's important to make it part of your culture. Um, because one of the things, for example, that you want is to make sure that the folks that are going to respond to any kind of aggressive incident have training in how to manage it. So, for example, if you think about security force, for example, a lot of security officers aren't really trained in de-escalation in a hospital setting. They're really trained to manage situations really well. But if you've got somebody that's really under stress in a hospital situation, that training may not work. But security is often the first folks who are going to call. So making sure that those folks are able to incorporate those de-escalation skills into what they're what they're doing. I think the second thing that's really important is to look at the administrative culture. We started talking about earlier, what's the buy-in? Some hospitals and clinics find themselves really engaged in behavioral health work. It's what they do. They feel very comfortable with it. Others really want to keep it at arm's length. And so trying to develop a culture where responding to behavioral issues becomes the norm and people can do that compassionately and do it without becoming frustrated very easily because it's very patient-centered work. And I think the more people understand the patient-centeredness of what we do, the more people are able to really, really engage and be a lot more, a lot more involved. And then the third piece I think that's important is to look at the outcomes for staff. If you think about trying to retain staff, trying to train new staff, that's one of the hardest things for health systems to do. And so trying to think about the return on investment, even if you feel like the time for training, the extra effort we're putting into it may not be worth it. If you're able to retain additional staff members and not have to retrain, I think that's definitely one of the, one of the huge benefits. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, you know, sharing those quick pieces of advice and your wisdom about this work. I think that you really are um, kind of leading the way um, in terms of the outcomes you've been able to achieve. And so we're really, really appreciative that you were able to come share with us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Thanks for listening to Advancing Health. Please subscribe and rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Mm-hmm.